Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. This is Emily Hicks, and you're listening to the Elder Law Hour, where we're offering insights and solutions for today's seniors so you can age with confidence. And we have a great show for you guys today. I hope that everyone is enjoying their new year and getting used to writing 2024. I know that I am trying. (laughs) We have Brian Renzio is back with us. And Brian, if you haven't caught him in a previous show, he's an attorney and mediator at Onsbacher Law. And he's also a former St. John's County judge. And he's going to be joining us today to talk about mediation and how you can achieve your goals when you go to mediation instead of both parties leaving unhappy. So he's got some great insights for us today. And then we have Vicki Oaks, the supervisor of elections back with us. And she's going to be giving us some very valuable information about voting in the important elections this year. We have a very big year coming up for elections. So she's going to tell us all about how to vote. There are so many different ways to vote and the new policies and procedures for voting by mail. So make sure that you tune in for that. But first we have Travis Doshi. And if you haven't heard Travis uh, talk with us before, he is a wealth of knowledge. He is with Atlas Wealth Advisors. And today we're going to talk about college savings plans and all of the benefits that have recently been put in place with 529, 529 plans. And if you are a grandparent, how you can take advantage and set your kids up for some savings with college. And I believe that we're also going to, if we have time, we are going to touch on some inherited IRAs. And I have a lot of questions that I want to ask Travis about that. So stick around. We've got a great show. Welcome back to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. And I am here with Travis Doshi, and we are going to be talking all things finance and college savings and retirement and all of that good stuff today. So Travis, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. And I appreciate you sitting and and talking us through. It's it's a new year. We've got a lot of of new and exciting opportunities for for everybody to look at. But uh, yeah, again, Travis Dosh with Atlas Private Wealth Advisors. Been working with people on our financial planning for well over 20 years. And we've seen an evolution of, of people's objectives. We've seen an evolution of the rules. And we have some a lot of strategies that help people get from A to B successfully. So for people this year that are are newly looking at their goals, setting their, their New Year's resolutions, I'd say reach out and, and make sure you're taking full advantage of the opportunities in front of you. Don't let don't let another year slip by before you do the things that you, you've always wanted to do. Yes, absolutely. And the rules keep changing on us every year. So it's so important to stay up to date and to keep in contact with your advisor because you just, you're, you miss out on opportunities, right? I mean, And some of that stuff we're going to talk about today. So I'd like to run something by you, Travis, and maybe you can help me out in this scenario. Okay. So as you know, I have three children, ages Mm -hmm. 12, nine, and eight. And for the 12 year old, you know, you always do like everything for your first one and then you kind of forget about the other ones. But (laughs) so for the 12 year old, at least when you have more than more than one or two, but we started a a prepaid college plan for her a few years ago. And it's a Florida prepaid. It's just the kind of standard four-year university package, you know, whatever that might be. So we started that. It's been fine. Obviously she's, you know, still in middle school. We don't really have any thoughts about it either way, but I'm needing to really do something for the other two kids. And I haven't started anything yet. So what are my options here? Well, to take a step back, education is is a, a massively expensive undertaking for most people. And you would find there's a select group that are saving and planning ahead. A lot of people are relying on student loans. We're at about $1.8 trillion has been borrowed for student loans as of today. So that is a massive toll. Uh, I would tell you from my perspective, the children who have not had their parents thinking ahead and planning ahead um, have ended up coming out of college 
with a mortgage payment before they've ever had their first job. You know, people are walking yes. out of schools with a quarter million dollars of student loans that are devastated uh, from a from a from a start from a launch point. You're already in the hole massively. Absolutely. And just from a personal standpoint, my parents thought ahead and prepaid for our school, which was phenomenal for us um, for undergrad. But then when I went to law school, I did take out student loans. But the difference in graduating from law school is my salary was probably two or three times higher coming out than the average, you know, four year degree. So I I knew I would be able to financially pay for that. Now, is it ideal? No, it is not. (laughs) It's never ideal to have student loans. But But I would never want my kids to take out any loans, especially in undergrad. I mean, that's just a really, really big thing for me because of my personal experience with it. So absolutely. How can how can we start planning for them so they would never be in that position? Yeah, that's and that's what needs to be done for people is is if you want to set your children up for the best opportunity they can have having these discussions early and understanding the options that are available are critical. You did a great first step by the Florida prepaid plan. That is an excellent tool, especially for an in-state college experience. You're already prepaying for a lot of the core costs that are out there, and it locks in the credit, the per credit price that you would would, would be subject to. So Yeah, and that was really the, my thing is um, locking that rate in. Yeah, and a lot of these have been inflating in the five to ten percent range in cost per year. So, depending on how much of a subsidy, you know, for state schools, if you have you actually seen subsidies decrease from the state level, so you've actually seen some of their tuitions, which started at a lower level, their percentage increase has been higher. A lot of your private schools, though, are still in that 5% per year range, well above normal inflation and have been for 30 years. So these costs are massive. There's schools out there where you would you would spend all in eighty dollars to $100,000 a year per year for your school. Four hundred grand is is a, a crazy but a, but a real number for people. And right. again... These are kids who haven't had their first job yet. So you're taking <laughs> on massive debt before you've ever, ever seen it. So yeah. to your point, they're planning ahead. Excellent to- tool is, is having those prepaid plans. A secondary option that not a lot of people understand is a, is a tool called a 529 plan, 529 plan. Okay. And those are a tool that works at really any accredited institution, and they have expanded what that tool can do. So that tool is designed to take money that is that has already been taxed, that you run through a paycheck or it's in savings, and put that money into an account that grows tax deferred, and if used for an institution, it is tax-free. So if it's used for a college now they've expanded that, but you can actually use this for like private high schools. There's other potentially trade schools that you could use this for. They've expanded the definition. A lot of this came about because Congress members tend to have very high levels of assets and income, and they basically wanted to craft the perfect tool to support their grandchildren. And they have tinkered with this year after year and improved it for themselves and we get to use that to their to your benefit. So hey, at least we get it now, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now we've got it. Uh, but it it's is, not just not, for legislators. <laughs> no, it's, it's a it's a very unique it actually has some estate tax benefits that they've baked into it. It has massive taxation benefits uh, tied to it uh, in the fact that it's tax free. They've added to it for this year, so to start this year, is a benefit that if the money doesn't all get used for college, it can be, some of it can be, or all of it can be converted into a Roth IRA for the child or, or for somebody else. It can be moved. So there's some brand new rules that are kicking in that, again, they're only making this tool better. And what it means is you're also not limited to what state you're going to go to school in. So a lot of the prepaid plans are very targeted per state. 
But if you end up in Georgia, if you end up in Connecticut, where you know wherever you end up in school, those prepaid plans don't have the same benefits of a 529, which are totally flexible tools. They can be used, again, accredited institution, you've got no problem at all. Where the issue comes up is, do the parents own it? So when you do financial aid, the biggest question I get is, what, what counts? And I have a, an insight into what some of the FAFSA rules are, but really what they're looking at is, is four things. They're looking at the child's assets. They're looking at the child's income. And then they'll take a step back and they'll say, they'll look at the parent's assets and the parent's income. And that determines a lot of your financial aid awards and, and, and options that come up. Right. So if the child, for whatever reason, makes a lot of income, they're going to take a vast majority of that and say, that's coming off any financial aid award. It, you mean if they're a YouTuber or something like they're that? YouTuber, <laughs> exactly. You know, they're, they're all going to be the YouTube stars. That's my so, kid's dream, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some YouTube shows lined up, as we are as well, YouTube stars. <laughs> oh that, that's, the new, that's the new American dream, I guess, for kids nowadays. I don't know. But yeah. That's, that's you know, that's the get rich quick scheme that is, <laughs> that is, is taking over, taking the world by steam. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, it's not, it, it's, if there are incomes, if the, if we put a bunch of assets, for instance, you gift a bunch of assets to the child, you know, they're going to look at easily 50% of those assets and say those should be applied towards college costs. So this is the trick is I talked about parents and I talked about the, the child, but grandparents, that's a different category. That's that if you have an asset that's owned by the grandparents, like a 529, the grandchild could be the beneficiary of that money. The grandparent still controls the asset. It's still, they're able to move around. They can change beneficiaries. So let's say the 529 was open for your oldest, but didn't need the money and the youngest needed uh, additional funding. You can shift the beneficiary of that 529. The grandparent can do it once per year to a different beneficiary. For, for that money. So that becomes incredibly important as a tool to maintain, especially for multiple children. And as that money accumulates, again, it's a tool for the grandparents to help their family provide for education. I've had some groups max fund these, and what they end up doing is creating a, an education legacy that is left for their, their grandchildren, potentially great-grandchildren, this is money that can keep snowballing, tax-deferred, tax-free for them. And all you really have to do is set up a secondary owner. So if anything did happen, it can only have one owner. But if, say, your father wanted to, to set up something like this, he would be the owner to begin with, but you could be the, the backup owner. Of okay. This, or, or another family member could be the backup owner of it, just in case anything happened before the children went to school and before they utilized the money. Right. Because if my dad is really looking at this idea, he wants to provide for his grandchildren's education. And he's really thinking about getting some of this stuff set up because that's just kind of on his mind. So what I think I'm hearing from you is that if they go to apply for scholarships, financial aid, do the application. And I'm not quite familiar with it yet because it's been a while since I've done it and it'll be a while since they do it, but I need to educate myself, right? So when they go to apply for any type of financial aid, let's say, if he's the owner of that account, it won't count against them. I think that's what, I think that's what you're saying, right? That's a lot of it. To recap, FAFSA as a core is looking at child's assets and child's income and parents' assets and parents' income. Grandparents are a special class. It's not really looked at as an asset of either or an income stream of either. It's not fair in the process in case a grandparent made a ton of income and assets but no involvement in paying for the grandchild's education. It wouldn't be fair for the schools to, to look to that. So they ignore that for the most part on these, these programs, which leaves a very big window of opportunity. Again, a lot of these tools were designed by Congress to benefit people <laughs> in Congress. These are these are very smartly crafted rules 
that if you understand how to play the game, especially for your for your future goals for your family, you can play the game very smart and have a lot more in resources for the family at the end of the day. So I would say 529s have become one of the primary tools we're using to pay for education. It's become the biggest single tool that is keeping kids out of this crushing debt coming out of, of college. And it's playing the, the financial aid game smartly as well. And this is one of the tools that does both. It, it saves money for the future. It has a lot of tax advantages. And on the back end, again, that ability to convert this into a Roth IRA and then have a pool of money for a beneficiary that is a truly long-term gift. You know, a Roth IRA, at least the rules today, doesn't require any distributions to come out down the road. That money can stay in there throughout their entire lives and keep growing tax deferred and tax free. These, at the end of this process, again, 529s and the Roth IRAs are the most advantaged, tax advantage tools that are out there. And if you're not taking advantage of those, you're missing you're missing the you're missing the boat. It's it's too huge of an opportunity to ignore the idea to pay full taxes on the same thing, especially compounded over a lot of years, dramatically changes how much money you have to work with. And and I think it's it's maybe like a 25 year window. It could be double the balance, and and by avoiding all those taxes, you would have to otherwise pay. So. Yeah, it, I, I'm amazed that they have added this on and yeah. because that was really the, like we talked about, that was kind of the stickler with a 529 is, oh, it can only be used for this purpose. But now that you can actually convert that unused money to a Roth IRA is amazing. I hope everyone really finds out about this because that it's just such an amazing tool. So I'm so glad that you have brought this up. Now, what about, you know, with IRAs? So let's, let's kind of talk about IRAs for a minute. With a Roth IRA, you know, as opposed to traditional, what are the limits that you can contribute to that in a year, let's say, like your annual, is there a limit to how much you can, let's say this is one that you said, it's not employer, it's just you one that you self-directed or whatever. So what a lot of people think about when they think of a Roth IRA is that contribution limit. It adjusts each year, you're able to put a set dollar amount. So if you're going to put $7,000, for instance, in as an individual, you can make a contribution into a Roth IRA. What we're finding is that's not, that is a way to get money in, but it's not the most common. There is an ability to convert IRA assets or retirement assets into Roth IRAs. So let's say you worked for a company for, for 30 years and you retired, but maybe you had a couple years before you turned on your pension or social security payments, a lot of your income streams. So you had kind of an artificially low couple of years for taxes, and you're living off your savings, you're living off your investment returns. Um, that gives you a perfect window to convert assets from IRAs to Roth IRAs. You're in a very low tax position, so you're only paying taxes on the part you convert, and you can put unlimited amounts into a Roth IRA. The limits would come from how much in taxes does it make sense for you to take in a given year. If you can spread it out for a couple of years, that's even better. But we're seeing people set aside hundreds of thousands in blocks into Roth IRAs because it's tax-free forever now. All of that growth, all of that money no matter what happens, you got to remember still the Federal Reserve, the, the federal government is running about $2 trillion a year in the red this year. They're going to burn through $2 trillion more than they're taking in the revenue. So two ways to fix that. They could cut spending, which they've never figured out a way to do, or they raise more revenue. And that comes in the forms of taxes. So we are worried about future tax liability. But when you're tax free, <laughs> that's not your problem, at least with that chunk of money. So it's a perfect combination to get money into a tax advantaged form. 
The other part to talk about is a normal IRA, like I said, where we're converting from for a lot mm -hmm. of people. Yeah. Is this IRA has subject to what's called a required minimum distributions. And that means once you're over age 73, they keep moving the date sometimes. There's it was, you know, it, 72. it was 72, yeah. Yeah, there was a there was a bunch of different dates, and there's even talk that they may up that at some point to a higher number, maybe 75. But anyway, as of the rules today, 73, and you've got to take a certain percentage of your IRA balance out each year and pay taxes on it. And that percentage gets higher each year as you the percentage is higher each year as you age. So the percentage of assets that need to 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 leave the account, but if you already have a pension, if you already have Social Security coming in, if you already have other streams, annuity income, and you're forced to take this additional amount, those higher and higher percentages can start to push you up into higher and higher tax brackets. Right. So we have people that hadn't done anything with these, but at 90 years old, they need to take out on a, on a $500,000 IRA balance. They've got to pull an additional fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year in taxable income on top of their other income. It pushes them into other brackets. So, taking advantage of these opportunities to convert to Roth takes it out of that equation. If you shrink the balance down to two hundred and fifty thousand, now you're only taking you know ten percent off two hundred fifty. You can you can control your effective tax rate over the long haul by by making some of these adjustments proactively most people have no idea what that means but talk to us <laughs> there's some yeah. some caveats to all this stuff but the, it is very doable and it is smart money to to keep the money in your pocket versus paying additional taxes we're not gaming the system in any way this is how the game is set up but if you're not playing the game you're 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 losing so this is this is smart use of that the other key thing that's changed, and it's very important to understand, is in the past, we used to have what's called stretch IRAs. They were the ability for a beneficiary of an account to stretch that money out over their entire lifetimes. Uh, so you were looking at children, you being able to use it for their lifetimes, or even grandchildren being able to stretch it for their lifetimes. The rules have changed. And the rules now on Roth IRAs and regular IRAs is the money has to be taken out within 10 years. Yeah, and which is a real bummer for me because <laughs> because this is like my dad's try. He, he, um, you know, in our family, he has really he's done well with his IRA, and his goal. I mean, he in his mind, the best thing he can do for me and my sister is to leave us this retirement account. I said, well, you know. That's great. And I am so grateful that you, I mean, he's, it's a source of pride for him. I think with a lot of people, maybe just, you know, in that generation, they, they want to leave something for their children, but Absolutely. let's say it's a, just for ease of calculating, let's say it's a million dollar IRA. And so now let's say something happens to him in the next year, which God forbid, I hope, <laughs> I'm like, I don't even want to say it out loud, but if something happens and then <laughs> you know, I inherit this, let's say million dollar IRA, that all has to be paid out yeah. within 10 years, right? And so now I've got that as taxable income on top of my active income, correct? Exactly. That's the major problem. That's on top. And up until they waived it for last year. So they have waived the requirement because these rules have changed. They're in place, but they haven't come up with a great mechanism to track all this. So they waived any penalties for not taking distributions. Okay. That waiver does not yet exist for 2024. So what that really means is, yes, you have to take out. So if easy math here, you're going to need to take out $100,000 per year on that million dollar distribution for 10 years on top. That's all income on top of your regular income. So you're going to you're going to feel that. And whatever residual balance in year 10 has to be taken out. So all the growth it's had, maybe that's a $200,000 a year. Again, all taxable income. And again, it's an amazing gift. It's a perfect opportunity to do something. But the planning that should be done is to look at his situation and say, wait, maybe he's in a lower tax bracket than I am. Mm -hmm. Maybe he should be taking some monies from this and converting it to a Roth or moving it to other things, which 
have a massive tax advantage for the beneficiaries, you get to keep more of the money. Everybody gets to keep more of the money. Right. By, by understanding the rules and playing that game correctly, the gifting to the grandchildren, there's many different ways you can do this that doesn't leave, you know, we call it a tax bomb. It, it's just something that's sitting out there waiting to go off. At some point, somebody's going to get hammered with the taxes and we can disarm that by working proactively ahead. And it absolutely is important to, to understand that. Again, these are for the new year. These are the amazing things we plan for with people. And again, the rules do keep changing, but take advantage of the rules that exist today. And tomorrow we'll play a slightly different game, but there, there's there's ways to win at all these things. That's a big part of, of what you and I both did for, right. for people. Well, thank you so much for for clarifying all of that. This has been really, really great information for for myself included, but certainly for our listeners as well. So thank you, Travis. And like he said, play the game and get with Travis Stashi. He knows how to play the game. So definitely hit him up at Atlas and we will put a link to him on our website, elderlawhour.com. But if they want to get in touch with you, Travis, how should they do that? Emily, the, the best way to reach me, again, Travis Lashi, give me a call. It's 949-244-9568. Again, 949-244-9568. Or you can email me at tdashi, T-D-A-U-C-H-Y, at atlas, A-T-L-A-S, P-W-A.com. I look forward to talking to you guys and let me know what questions come up from this. Thank you again, Emily. And thank you so much for being here. This has been great. And you've been listening to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. We'll be right back. Are you approaching retirement or entering a new chapter of life? Now is the time to consider critical decisions that impact your future and the well-being of your loved ones. As you navigate this transition, ensure you've secured your legacy through proper estate planning. Don't fall into the common misconception that you and your spouse can make decisions for each other in times of legal incapacity without a plan in place. Without proper estate planning, you risk a probate judge making decisions for you, which can be costly and cumbersome for your spouse. Protect your assets and ensure they align with your unique circumstances and objectives. Avoid the default state laws that may not reflect your wishes and could lead to unintended consequences, such as disinheriting your spouse or forcing them to litigate your estate. You also may be considering the possibility of a new relationship after the loss of a spouse. It's essential to enter these relationships with clarity, safeguarding your assets and preserving existing family ties. A premarital agreement becomes crucial in these situations, providing legal protection and clarity. When it comes to your children, thoughtful estate planning is key. Protect their inheritance from squandering, divorces, lawsuits, and bankruptcies. Your hard-earned wealth should be a source of security, not vulnerability. Additionally, plan for long-term care, a significant consideration as you enter retirement. Secure a long-term care insurance policy while you still qualify and explore alternatives that can convert into life insurance if not needed. Statistics show a 70% likelihood of requiring long-term care after the age of 65, making proactive planning essential. Our team can guide you through this process, helping you replace impersonal state-written plans with a tailored approach that safeguards your assets and family. Don't overlook estate planning as you approach retirement. Book a call with us today to secure your future with confidence. Visit emilyhickslaw.com and book a call today. We'd love to help. Welcome back to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. And I have a very special guest today, Brian Renzio. Brian is an attorney, a former judge, and he is now practicing as a mediator. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So there's a lot of myths about mediation. and, And just from my experience, you know, as an attorney that when I started out a million years ago, I did a little bit of litigation. I was probably the worst litigator ever known to the area of law because I hated it so much, but we're taught that mediation is basically where both sides lose. So (laughs) how, so Brian, tell us, how do you get the most out of mediation? Let's get right into it. How do you actually make it worthwhile for both sides? Yeah, it's interesting because I used to hear that too. I've I've got a background in construction litigation and years ago when you walk into mediation 
the mediator would sit there in front of everyone and say, this is going to be a good mediation if everyone leaves unhappy and everyone feels like they lost. And when I became a mediator and as I went through the process, it didn't sound right to me. It just didn't fit the model and the mode of what we're supposed to do as a mediator. And the more I thought about it, the more I did mediations, I realized to me personally that that old adage really didn't fit. And what I tell people when they come into mediation is there's a continuum between happy and unhappy and that's content. And what I tell people is I'm not a fan of telling anyone that if you both leave unhappy, it was good mediation. I think if you leave content, it was a good mediation. And what I explained to everyone is what I mean is if you were going to get everything you wanted, you wouldn't need to be here. You're not going to get everything you want. You have to make hard decisions. You have to have hard discussions. And then once you do that and go work through the process, you're going to get to a point where you feel content and say, even though I may not be getting everything I want, I am not going to be spending legal fees. I'm not going to be consuming my life with this for the next year and a half. And I'm okay. And more important, I know what I'm leaving with versus the uncertainty of a trial or arbitration where you have no idea. Everyone says I'm going to win and nobody knows. Like as a former judge, I can tell people you, you don't know what's going to happen. There's someone making a decision for you. And most times that person as a trial is going forward is taking dubious notes going through everything. But the judge doesn't even know until toward the end, until the judge has the opportunity to really absorb everything that's happened. So nobody knows what's going to happen. So again, if you leave content, I think that's the way to do it, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and be prepared when you're, when you're actually there. Right. <laughs> I well, no, And I agree. I, part of the, the problem with mediation, mediation is self-directed. The mediator cannot tell anyone what to do as a neutral, what you have to do. The parties have control over the process. And it's a great thing because when you have control over the process, you are the one putting your destiny in your hands. And personally, I think that's a great position to be in for anybody, because again, you can control what's going to happen. But with that said, part of having that control is being prepared. To me, mediations, I always say they're like an iceberg. The actual mediation session is the tip of the iceberg. 99% of what's under the water is the preparation. And that's preparing. You know, attorneys talking to their clients, having a game plan, having a proposal in mind, having some backup proposals in mind, knowing what we're going to do. And that way you can have positive discussions. If you start the mediation session where everyone comes in cold and it seems like they're meeting their attorneys for the first time, it makes it a little tougher. And I know different circumstances, different areas of law, it, it's going to happen. But to the extent parties can prepare, I think it helps. Part of that to me too is if there's a request for a mediation summary or statement, which is just an outline of what's going to happen, what your position is, typically the courts will require the attorneys to give that to the mediator. I appreciate that as a mediator because it gives me a snapshot of what I'm about to go through. But more important for me, I want the other side to see it because to make positive moves and have positive discussions, I think everyone needs to at least have some understanding of where the other side's coming from. It doesn't mean you have to show things you don't want to show the other side. There are parts that are going to be, you're going to hold back. It's a confidential process. But I think you need to let the other side show some cards to make it productive. If you come in and you don't show anything and then you're starting cold from the moment you walk in, it just it, it's to me, you're not hitting the ground running. Yeah, it's amazing how the different perspectives are, too. I mean, there's everyone says, oh, there's always two sides to the story. And there are as many sides to the story as people who know the story. I mean, it's everybody has a different perspective and is coming from a different place. But and like you said, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the the sadder stuff that you in the legal field and certainly that you saw as a judge. And that's issues with families. You were a family court judge for, for quite a while and you probably saw it all, didn't you? <laughs> I did. There was you, you get a lot of as a unified family law judge, you handle essentially the entire family. So if there was anything from a dependency action involving foster care, uh, any drug addiction issues or dependency issues you dealt with, you know, obviously the solution with drug divorces, but you get every part of it. You get the Marchman Act, the Baker Act, you get everything. And dependency, especially, you see a lot of, you know, there are a lot of bad days, as I would say, for families where you really see, you know, the hard times that families are going through, but then you see good times too. There's a lot of positives with it as well. You know, I had an interesting client issue come up recently where my client had a child. Um, the She and the father were not married and he really um, 
I'm not sure if he ever truly acknowledged uh, paternity formally. I, I do think he was on the birth certificate, but she had an issue when we were doing her estate plan. She really wants, if something were to happen to her, she's a single parent. And I, I, this is kind of a common scenario. The dad didn't have anything to do with the kid. And she really wanted to make sure that her sister would be the one to raise the child should anything happen to her. And so I'm doing as much research as I can to figure out how, how we can make that happen, but really terminating someone's parental rights. That's, that's a pretty big deal. And, uh, you know, it's not something that's easy to do, right? No, it's, it's not, it's, it's a death. It's essentially a death because once a person's parental rights are terminated, the parents don't have any contact with the child or the children and the children you don't have any contact with the parents, you know, as a, as a judge, what I looked at, I think you were always taught the standard of most areas of law, what's in the best interest of the child. But I think you really focus on the fact that you've got these children out there that you're doing the best you can. And, and it's something that I don't think the court system ever takes lightly. I know because it was such a hard process and it is the death of a family unit that it's a it's got a lot of protections in place. It's not something that happens too common where it's going to happen. And I would feel pretty safe saying that at least from the experiences I had when it did happen, everybody tried everything they could because you're trying to keep a family intact. But when it's not possible and it's not feasible for the health and safety of a child, unfortunately, you have to get to that point where you do have to terminate. But the other positive thing I had as a family law judge was I couldn't tell you how many times that we would have termination of parental rights, but then right after that, you would have a foster family or a family who had the child and they would adopt the child. So you also got to do adoptions. And that was a, a really exciting and fun part for me because you would go in and you would see these children who had no control over what was going on. Their life is put through a living hell. But then on the other side of it, there's a, a loving family ready to take them home and they become part of the family. And it, it, it really does come full circle when you see that because you live the worst moments of that child's life and then you see the best moments. And it's really rewarding to see that with, you know, having the family unit to see how these families come together as if, you know, the child had been born to that family. It's amazing. Oh, that is amazing. I'm sure that was really um, rewarding for you as a judge to be a part of really helping uh, to contribute to someone's bright future in that instance. I'm sure with families, I mean, there, there can be so many issues. Domestic violence is one of those issues that is just a terrible thing to, to witness and, and to feel like, you know, it's one of those things that it's cyclical. It's, it's a cycle. When the kids grow up in that situation, they seem to repeat that because kids are just completely impressionable. And, you know, the, the cycle continues and we had a, 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 pretty crazy incident here at the beach where it was a, a younger kid attacked his girlfriend a few months ago at a restaurant off A1A. And it really brings it home to you when you see something in public like that. I mean, these things are happening behind closed doors all the time, but when it's brought to light in public, it really makes you, it makes you think like, wow, this is, this is crazy. I'm sure you've seen a lot of that yeah. in your experience. Yeah, and I think that one was was really heartbreaking in the sense that you really it it was there you could see it and it was in our community on a beach road and you see the after effect. But the one thing that I think the takeaway is to see the courage of the survivor, how strong she is, and how strong her family is to get her through this and to move forward and say. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to speak out and help other people and, you know, fight for herself. I, I like the fact that you see that it gives the hope. And as a judge, yeah, you see a lot of, when I was a judge, you would see a lot of the injunction court and you see the, the instances that come in. And again, it's heartbreaking. You see victims that come in who are shattered and then you see victims that come in that are shattered, their lives are destroyed and they have kids. And yeah. It's, it makes it tough. You're dealing with that and you do the, you know, you do the best you could to try to protect these individuals, but you, yeah, it was a pretty constant thing. But it's a cause that you feel very strongly about, right? You're involved in charities that support victims of domestic violence. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. When I was a, a judge, I was on a domestic violence task force and 
having been a part of the injunction process, seeing that it made me really cognizant of what's going on to, to families on a daily basis. And then after leaving the bench and being a mediator now, I was invited back to that organization, the Betty Griffin Center, to be a board member. So I'm currently a board member on that organization right now. And they, they do fantastic work. The, the individuals there are great. They are truly there for the victims and the victims' families because you have, it's not just one victim sometimes, you have the children involved. So you have to protect the victim and the children, make sure they have shelter, they have services, they have everything they need to try to live as normal a life as they can under these traumatic and horrific situations. Yeah, it's amazing. And you guys have a fundraiser coming up, don't you? We do. March 4th in Ponte Beach at Plantation, we've got our very first inaugural survivor breakfast. So we're excited about that. We're asking folks to please go to the Betty Griffin website, sign up for a seat. We want to make sure it's sold out and make this our great first event. It's a good cause. We're going to have a lot of community leaders there. We're going to have a lot of you know community folks there just to support and really build upon it. We're hoping to make this a great event so we can build upon it every year. Well, that sounds great. And what a, what a great cause and what a, a great place. They do such good work there. So thank you so much for telling us about that. And Brian, if someone is in need of mediation, how should they get in touch with you? Yeah, I think the easiest way is to go to the, the website for the firm I work for, Onswalker Law, so they can go to www.onswalker.net or call the phone number. And my assistant is Regan Smith. She can set up a mediation. And I've, I've also got an online calendar. So there's it's pretty easy to set one up with me, but I'm always receptive. It's what I love to do. Being a, being a judge was amazing. And I, I enjoyed every moment of it. It was very fulfilling. But being a mediator is likewise fulfilling because you get to put the pieces of the puzzle together for folks. And I, I enjoy doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And we will put a link to to Brian's website on our website, elderlawhour.com, if you want to go over there and check out more about today's episode or more about how to get in touch with Brian. If you're in need of mediation, please head on over to elderlawhour.com. And Brian, thank you so much for being here. We're out of time for now, but thanks so much for telling us about the Betty Griffith Center and all of the wonderful things that you have going on. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. All right. And you've been listening to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. We will be right back. This is Vicki Oaks, your St. John's County Supervisor of Elections. The 2024 elections are coming. They will be here soon. Are you election ready? If not, and you need to be, you can visit our website at votesjc.gov. That's votesjc.gov or contact our office at 904 823 Two two three eight. Make sure you are election ready. Welcome back to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks, and I have Vicki Oaks, the Supervisor of Elections for St. Johns County, here with me today. Vicki, thank you so much for being here. Emily, thank you so much for having me. Well, we've been talking and chatting, and I'm actually learning a lot about the election process myself, having even worked for a county before. So this has been really great. We've got a lot of good information that we can tell our voters today. Let's start with all of the ways that one can vote nowadays. There's a lot of different ways we can vote. Yes, and I say voting's never been easier than it is today. Any registered voter can request a ballot and vote by mail. We have early voting prior to each election and my favorite part about early voting is there's no wrong place to go as long as you vote within the county you live you can pick the date time and location and vote when it's convenient for you and then for the traditionalist we have your neighborhood precinct is always open on election day from 7 a.m to 7 p.m so there's three choices really about when where and how you would like to cast your ballot. So if you are a traditionalist like myself and you wait until election day, you have to go to your precinct, your actual voting office, right? That's correct. Your okay. voting location. Your voting location. But if you are probably busy on election day like like Mrs. Mrs. Oaks is <laughs> and you want to vote early, you can do that at any location, right? Yes, in the county in which you live. For example, depending upon whether it's a primary or general, our days vary. 
minimum of eight days, maximum of 13. So we set up locations all over the county. Their hours vary. You just pick which location, and our early voting dates always include two Saturdays and one Sunday, so you get to pick when, where, and how you want to go vote, cast your vote in person. Okay, great. Let's talk a little bit about voting by mail. Now, I like to vote in person, I'm not going to lie, but a few years ago, I actually did vote by mail, so let's talk about how you can do that. And what are the procedures for if you want to vote by mail? Okay, it's very simple. You just have to request your ballot. And you can do that by contacting the elections office, call the office, and or you can simply go on our website, use the tools we have available to make your request. Now, let me mention that the law changed last year. All the vote by mail ballot requests expired following the 2022 general election We had a complete reset. So if you are planning on voting by mail in the 2024 election, now's a great time. Go ahead and make your request while you're thinking about it. Yeah, so there's a new law in place now that you have to request for every cycle, right? Yes, every election cycle. You can request today for the 24 elections and you can get them for all three elections okay so that'll cover you for each one of those in 2024 yes that's okay. correct okay good all right and then as a vote by mail voter you have some responsibilities you have to make sure number one that your address on file with us is correct and we always urge voters when they call in make or request their ballot online, check your address first. Make sure your information is up to date because I'm going to be mailing you your ballot. And vote by mail ballots are not forwardable. So if you've moved, that ballot's going to come back to us. It's They're returned undeliverable. They come right back to us. They are not forwardable. So it's important that voters make sure their information is correct with us. And then it's also very important as a vote by mail ballot voter, make sure you get your ballot back to the elections office in time for your ballot to be counted. Okay. Florida's deadline is election day at 7 p.m. Your ballot has to be in the elections office. Okay. So you've got some some rules. So if you're planning to vote by mail, make sure that you have your address up to date and make sure you get your ballot back on time. Yes, and then let me mention, too, voters, it's real important for voters to keep their signature up to date on file with our office. Because if you think about it, when you vote in person, you have to show your identification. Well, when you vote by mail, your signature is your identification. And the law requires the supervisors, when you send in your vote by mail ballot, I am required by law to check the signature that's on your envelope against the signature on your voter file, and the two must match in order for your ballot to be counted. Oh, okay. So don't go getting fancy with your signature on your ballot, right? (laughs) Right. You want to sign it um, like is on your voter record. Okay. And that's real important. Uh, We do have a provision in the law that if people don't sign their envelope or their signature does not match, we actually reach out to the voters by phone, email, and uh, regular mail to let them know, hey, there was a problem with your vote-by-mail ballot. Here's what you need to do in order to cure your ballot and still have it count. They have to complete an affidavit and provide it back to us along with copies of their photo identification at least by the second day after the election at 5 p.m. Okay. So I was just thinking about for some of our listeners that may have um, some issues with, you know, tremors or, or, you know, things like that. And I'm thinking of uh, one of my clients in particular, you know, is can't write the way she used to. So you guys have a lot of accommodations for people that have disabilities and, you know, perhaps that issue as well, right? Yes, we do. So we encourage people to update their signature. That's, you can do that simply by filling out a voter registration application and dropping them in the mail to us. 
If you need one, we'll be happy to mail you one. You can always download them right off of our website. Okay. And for voters with disabilities, the law allows any voter to be able to request assistance when they go into a, an early voting site or a precinct to vote. If they don't bring someone with them, they can request assistance. We have two poll workers of opposite parties that will be assigned to assist them whatever they need. And then we have a ballot marking device called an express vote where a voters with disabilities can cast their ballot independently. And that's even a voter who's blind. We have a headset and then a, a, pa- a keypad that has Braille on it. So a person can actually navigate and cast their ballot without assistance. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways you can accommodate people according to whatever disability or limitation that they may have. So that's really, that's a wonderful thing. Let's talk a little bit about security because I know a lot of people, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of, you know, Florida gets a really bad rap. I mean, you know, we get a bad rap for a lot of things. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we really do. But, and some of it, you know, is fair, but let's talk about election security because there's a lot of people moving into the state And there's a lot that they don't know about, you know, how we do things here. But you guys even open up your offices to people, right? So they can see the process. Yes. In 2021, we opened our doors and began conducting tours of our office, which is really a behind the scenes look at how elections are conducted, not just in St. John's County, but in the state of Florida. We let people um, get a look at what we do. We give them information and let them ask any questions that they have. It's the tours about two hours. We had them all during 21, 22. We've had them all during 23. We concluded them now for this year, but we will open them back up. We'll go into lockdown in January for our March election because of security. Sure. But in April and May and early June, we'll be offering some more office tours. I encourage anyone that has questions, give us a call. Come ask questions. Yeah. We are always absolutely happy to answer any questions anybody we have. What are some of the questions that you guys get about this uh, subject, about the security and about fraud and things like that? Have have you seen a lot more of those questions lately? Yeah, since the 2020 elections. Yeah. And so those are the first two that come to my mind are photo and signature identification when people vote in person. Well, the fact of the matter is Florida's had those laws in place since the 80s. Check, got that one. (laughs) The second one is paper ballots. Well, I agree. I'm an absolute advocate of paper ballots, Mm -hmm. that every voter in Florida has been casting their vote on a paper ballot since 2008. And if you live in St. John's County and been around a long time, You've been voting on a paper ballot since 1994. Mm -hmm. It's an actual physical record of how someone casts their votes. They come in handy in case of very close races. Any race that is less than one half of a percent requires a machine recount and then a manual recount if it's less than a quarter of a percent. So we have a process in place for that. Yeah. And speaking of security, you guys open up your office and you have all of these tours but when it comes to an actual election security is pretty tight right I mean you're not allowing there's there are places that people aren't always authorized to to be when you are counting ballots and and conducting the actual election right I mean you've got cameras you've got security everywhere it's a pretty tight uh, situation right yeah it is some of our uh, meetings of our canvassing board that we open and count our vote by mail ballots Some of those meetings are open to the public, and we have a public area where the public can come in and view and watch. And that really is part of our security processes that our elections are open and transparent. They always have been in Florida. We have poll watchers that are designated by political parties and candidates Those watchers are allowed in our precincts and our early voting site to watch and observe the elections process. 
and how voters are being processed, how our poll workers are accounting for each voter that's checked in, each ballot that's issued, and each ballot that's tabulated. We have a three-way check on that. Okay. And overall, our system is open, it's transparent. Some people are critical about it, but they don't ever come to our public meetings, <laughs> Yeah, is the fact of the matter. I say, come, watch, come see what our processes are, how detailed they are. Come and ask questions. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, and for those uh, people that have recently moved to Florida, we do things differently here. But let's talk a little bit about the primaries that we have a primary election uh, coming up and we do it a little bit differently than even Georgia. Right. You can only vote with the major parties and it has to be the ballot that you registered for previously. So can we talk a little bit about that? Yes, Emily, I'm so glad you brought that up. Florida is a closed primary state. And even in some states like Georgia, it means something different than it actually does in Florida. So in Florida, you register with a party. When you vote in a primary, that's the ballot that you receive, period. We have two major parties, Republican and Democrat. If you register as a voter with no party affiliation, you are not eligible to vote on partisan candidates in a primary election. Your party dictates the ballot that you receive in a primary okay of course a general election is open all the candidates names and the parties are listed on the ballot and you may vote for whomever you choose everyone gets the same ballots regardless of their party okay and we do have those uh dates coming up pretty soon right yes we do so have a very busy election schedule in 24 we have our march 19th presidential preference primary we have our august 20th federal, state, and local primary, and then November 5th will be our big general election. That's the big one. So lots of work and stuff coming up for you in the next year, right? Yeah, but we have spent all of 23 planning for the 24 election, and we'll be ready to go. You're going to be ready. I know you will. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you educating the Uh, listeners out there as to all the ways we can vote and how to how you're keeping everything secure well thank you and i appreciate the opportunity i really do and we will have a link to the supervisor of elections office and their phone number on our website elder law hour if you want to find out more about those those dates and find out more about vicki oaks i encourage you to head on over to elderlawhour.com and you've been listening to the elder law hour with emily hicks and we'll be right back Are you ready to invest in real estate without the headaches? Look no further than investjacksonville.com, your trusted partner in turnkey real estate investments. With over 18 years of experience, our process has been fine-tuned, and now we're opening up our team to other people just like you. At investjacksonville.com, we're selective about who we work with because we believe in delivering the best. Our dedicated acquisition team scours the market to find the finest properties, while our skilled construction and maintenance team ensures every detail is taken care of. From new roofs to granite countertops, HVAC systems to plumbing and electrical, we leave no stone unturned to make sure there's no surprises. We're in this together with our investors for the long haul. With our first year guarantee, we put our money where our mouth is. We guarantee your rental rate for the first year, giving you time to build reserves and budget for any surprises that may come your way later. We believe in our construction team and our tenant placement team, which is why we offer this unbelievable guarantee. We're committed to your success and peace of mind. We're passionate about making it simple and easy and a no-brainer for others to get started investing because we know what real estate can do for people to reach financial freedom. So if you're ready to invest with confidence, contact Invest Jacksonville today at 904-536-3000 or visit our website at investjacksonville.com. Let us show you why there's nobody quite like us. Investjacksonville.com, your authentic partner in hassle-free real estate investing. Contact us now. 
thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Elder Law Hour. If you would like to connect with us or learn more about today's show, please visit us at elderlawhour.com and we will catch you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. Join us this and every Saturday for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. 